Hello and welcome to Mallory in the Library. If you're joining us for the first time today, welcome. And if this is, um, if you're joining us again, welcome back. Today we have a very exciting um, set of books for you because some of you may have heard about poems and poetry and there are so many different ways that people can express themselves through poems. And so I have some examples that aren't the ones that I'm going to read today before we get into the ones that I'm going to share. So we can see that there's, this is a book called Today and Today, and it's a set of haiku that have been rearranged and illustrated. And haiku are very special um, Japanese poems that are done with syllables, and they look so beautiful when they're illustrated. Um, and they reflect a lot of the time seasons, nature, and just a single moment in time because they're so short. They're only three lines. Now, some people might think that poetry is very hard and it's hard to write and it's hard to understand. So I brought some stories that show us that poetry can be fun and it can be present in stories um, because that's really all poems are. It's just a different way of telling a story. So the first one that I'm going to share today is called On Wings of Words, and it's about the extraordinary life of Emily Dickinson. And she was a poet, and her story in, in this book is told in poems too. And so this is by Jennifer Byrne, and it's illustrated by Becca Stats, pardon me, Stadlander. And of course, my favorite part of any book is the dedication, which is who the uh, author wrote the book for. And Jennifer Byrne says, to the mystery that is Emily, and Becca Stadlander says, for mom and dad, which is very nice. Soft moonlit snow draped the Dickinson house in white. It reaches to the fence, it wraps it rail by rail, Till it is lost in fleeces, it flings a crystal veil. In a little room, in the dark before dawn, a baby girl was born. Her parents celebrated the holiday they called Emily. Emily met the world and began to explore. To little Emily, every bird, every flower, every bee or breeze or slant of light seemed to speak to her. She explored with her eyes, her ears, her thoughts, and found new words for everything she was discovering. The bee is not afraid of me. I know the butterfly. The brooks laugh louder when I come. When thunder crashed and lightning flashed, Emily got scared and called it the fire. Emily adored her older brother, Austin. She said, there was always such a hurrah wherever he was. She loved her school friends, who she said were a warmth as near as if the sun were shining on your hand. It's a very nice thing to say about a friend. Every day, Emily's life rippled with new joys and swayed with new feelings. It was clear Emily was becoming a person, in many ways, like other people, only more so. Her happies were happier, and her sads were sadder. Her thoughts were deeper, her desires were stronger, and oh, there was so much Emily loved. My heart grows light so fast that I could mount a grasshopper and gallop around the world, and not fatigue him any.
Most of all, Emily loved her books, the strongest friends of the soul, books. To Emily, every book was an adventure, a distant journey on a sea of words. And if a book was forbidden, well, that didn't stop Emily. Like the book she wanted that Austin smuggled into the house and hid inside the piano, Emily rushed it up to her room and read it in delicious secrecy. Every story she read at night by candlelight or in the garden's midday sun was a new passion, a ray of light. But there were shadows too. In the 1800s, which is when Emily Dickinson lived, sorrow was a daily companion. The sorrow of disease is incurable, accidents untreatable, and deaths too soon and too close. All of this frightened Emily. It flooded her mind with questions. Emily tried to find answers at home. She looked for answers at her church, and she searched for answers at school. But everywhere she looked, she was told to obey without asking, to believe without knowing why. So she began to put her faith in what she could see and understand. In the name of the bee and of the butterfly and of the breeze, amen. It's her, her prayer, I think. When her very religious school principal separated the class into hopers and no hopers, Emily was put in the group without hope. Yet Emily did have hope, her own kind. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. So with her hope, she sought the truth. Maybe you've heard someone say that before. Hope is the thing with feathers. Then, like rays of sun breaking through the clouds, her thoughts and feelings started to come to her as words. New words. Her own words. The robins, bumblebees, and daisies she loved. The dark diseases and frightening deaths, the unknowable God and mysterious heaven all came pouring out as poems. Things are budding and springing and singing. Answers she couldn't find in other people, she started to find in herself. I have been dreaming, dreaming a golden dream, with eyes all the while wide open. Her poems soothed her sadness. They gave her strength and they set her free. With the power of her words and the freedom of her imagination, she tasted spices in foreign lands and hid inside a flower. She leaned against the sun and dwelt in a house of possibilities and rode a carriage to the ends of time. She became a bird, a worm, a ghost, a god, a beggar, a king, a somebody, a nobody. I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us. Don't tell. They banish us, you know. How dreary to be somebody. How public, like a frog. To tell your name the live long June to an admiring bog. She called her letter to the world that never wrote to me. And so, with her words, her mind, Emily dove into the darkest depths of the sea and of sadness, and she rose up to the glowing heights of the sun and of joy. You might hear some other things with feathers in the background. Um, they're very chatty today. Emily saw the inner world was bigger than the world, than all the world outside. The brain is wider than the sky. For put them side by side, the one um, the other will contain, with case and you beside. Emily spent more and more time in her room, writing, creating, and she ventured out less and less. 
acceleration is within. As Emily's inner world grew bigger, her outer world grew smaller. Yes, there were things she still loved in the worldly world. She loved her gardens, the bees, the springtime, and the wind combing its fingers through the trees. And of course her family, a very few special friends, her big dog, Carlo, and children. Emily always loved children, but most people she saw rarely or not at all. Uh oh, we have another, another friend that's trying to join us. Emily began to dress in white, white light clouds like the foam on a wave, white like a cocoon in her room from which butterflies were born, butterflies that were poems that flew with Emily on wings of words. People in the town said Emily was weird and Emily was strange, but Emily didn't care what they said about her. Her world was somewhere else. My country is true. Emily never stopped writing and never stopped exploring. With every day and every poem, she saw more, discovered more, traveled deeper and soared higher for the rest of her life. On a Saturday in May in 1886, Emily died slipping into the eternity she had wondered about and written about all her life. Then something wonderful and amazing happened. Emily's sister, Vinny, opened drawers, trunks, boxes, and closets and found hundreds and hundreds of Emily's poems, more than anyone had ever imagined. Poems that, on the wings of Emily's words, flew out and away into the future and around the world. Today, almost every library, bookstore, school, and every city, city, and country has Emily's poems, Emily's words, and Emily's letters to each of us. The world is sleeping. We must be crowing cocks and singing larks and a rising sun to awake her. And in those words, you can hear Emily's voice echoing through the years speaking to you, to all of us who are brave enough to take pen in hand and to look deep and write what we discover. I dwell in possibility on a fairer house than prose, more numerous of windows, superior for doors, of visitors the fairest for occupation this, the spreading wide my narrow hands to gather paradise. And so this is some information about um, Emily Dickinson and some information about poetry. Um, but I think what's really beautiful about poetry is it doesn't have to follow anything. You can write down any of your ideas or thoughts and that can become a very beautiful poem. Um, and I think that that's what Emily believed too. And what's special about this book is that you can see when it's written in italics, those are lines from Emily's poems. And the illustrations are so beautiful. Uh, I think that anything with illustrations and poems can be very uh, unique and special. And so the next two poems that I want to share are a little bit sillier, so I hope everyone can be in a silly mood. This one is called The Cat and the Wizard, and it is a story set right here in Toronto. You might even recognize this castle is Casa Loma uh, in the annex. And I used to live right by there. So this story is very nice. Uh, it's by Dennis Lee and the illustrations are by Jillian Johnson. And let's see. This one is dedicated to Max. I'm not sure who Max is, but I'm sure that he loved this gift. Oh, and we can see the subway cars too, and the castle over here, really beautiful. A senior wizard of high degree with a special diploma in wizardry is trudging along at the, stop at the top of the street with a scowl on his face and a pain in his feet. Oh, well, let's take another little piece. A beard, a bundle, a right angle stoop, and a hand-me-down coat embroidered with soup, a halo of smoke and a sputtery sound, the only real magic magician around. But nobody nowadays welcomes a wizard. 
they'll take in a spaniel, make room for a lizard, but show them a conjurer still on the ball, and nobody wants him or needs him at all. His bundle is bulging with rabbits and string, and a sort of machine that he's teaching to sing, and a clock and a monkey that stands on its head, and a mixture for turning pure gold into lead. He carries a bird nest that came from the ark. He knows how to tickle a fish in the dark. He can count up by tens to a million and three, but he can't find a home for his wizardry. For nobody nowadays welcomes a wizard. They'll drool at a goldfish, repaint for a lizard, but show them a magus who knows his stuff. They can't slam their latches down quickly enough. A little sign on the house that says, no wizards. In Casa Loma lives a cat with a jet black coat and a spiffy hat. And every day at half past four, she sets the table for 12 or more. The spoons parade beside each plate. She pours the wine, she serves the steak, and shreddies and turnips and beer in a dish, though all she can stomach is cold tuna fish. But a cat is a cat in a castle or no, and people are people wherever you go. Then she paces about in the big dining hall, waiting and waiting for someone to call, who won't be too snooty for dinner and chat at the home of a highly hospitable cat. And every night, at every evening at half past eight, she throws out the dinner and locks the gate. And every night at half past 10, she climbs up to bed by herself again. For a cat is a cat in a castle or no, and people are people wherever you go. It sounds a little bit lonely. I wonder what will happen. One day they meet in a laundromat, the lonesome wizard and the coal black cat. And chatting away in the clammy air, they find they both like solitaire and merry-go-rounds and candlelight and spooky yarns that turn out right. They stroll together, chatting still, to Casa Loma on the hill. There's so many stairs at Casa Loma. If you've ever been, maybe you'll get to go. And there the cat invites her friend to share a bite if he'll condescend. And yes, the wizard thinks he might, but just for a jiffy and one quick bite. An hour goes by like a silver skate. The wizard moves from plate to plate. Two hours go by like shooting stars. The cat produces big cigars. And there in the darkening room they sit. A cat and a wizard candle it. At last the wizard takes the pack from his creaking, reeking, rickety back. He sets it down with a little shrug and pulls the rabbit from under the rug. And before you can blink, he's clapping his hands, and there in the doorway, a peacock stands. Now he's setting the monkey upon its head. He's turning the silverware into lead, and counting by tens from a hundred to four, and making a waterfall start from the floor, and juggling a turnip, a plate, and a dish, and turning them all into fresh tuna fish. And I wonder who would like the tuna fish. The cat is ecstatic, she chortles, she sails from the roof to the floor on the banister rails. And soon with the whole castle is whizzing with things, with sparklers and flautists and butterflies wings. Sounds a little bit more joyful than at the beginning, huh? And all through the night the party goes on till it stops in a trice at the crack of dawn. And the wizard installs his pack in a drawer while the cat tidies up the living room floor. And as the sky is growing red, they tiptoe up the stairs to bed.
The wizard snores rather weird. The cat is snuggled in his beard, dreaming of tuna fish end to end, and rabbits and having a brand new friend. Perhaps you wonder how I know how a cat, a cat, um, a cat and a wizard can carry on so. Well, if someday you chance to light on Casa Loma late at night, go up to the window, peek inside, and then you'll see. I haven't lied. For round and round the rabbits dance, the moon is high, and they don't wear pants. The tuna fish patrol the hall, the butterflies swim in the waterfall, and high and low with the hullabaloo, the castle whirls like a gypsy zoo. It would be quite the party, wouldn't it? And in the corner, if you peer, two other figures may appear. One is dressed in a spiffy hat, the queen of the castle, the jet black cat. The other's a wizard of high degree. The wizard is grinning, and the wizard is me. Oh, so maybe we'll have to go to Castle Oma sometime and check out who is living in the castle. And so the last story I want to share is pretty quick, so I think we'll get through it. And it is so silly. Um, it's called There Were Monkeys in My Kitchen. And this is by Sher Cherie Fitch and Mark Mongo. This one is really fun. And this one says, to my brother Sean and sister Leanne with memories of dancing days in Monkey Town, New Brunswick. So this one's by a Canadian writer too. And then the illustrator says, to Mathilde, my daughter. There were monkeys in my kitchen. There were monkeys in my kitchen. They were climbing up the walls. They were dancing on the ceiling. They were bouncing basketballs. Now you might think that sounds funny. Now you might think that sounds neat to see a thousand monkeys dancing to a funky monkey beat. But let me tell you, it was terrible. Hardest day I ever had. So believe, I was there, so believe me. It was bad. It was bad. That looks pretty chaotic. First there were gorillas in a grand ballet. Pirouette, arabesque, plie, saute. They were ballerina slippers and purple fishnet socks. And when they danced, the city shook for 49 blocks. So I called the police. I called the RCMP. I was fairly polite. I even said, please. As I shouted in the phone, ch 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 chimpanzees. Then quicker than it takes to do a double duty sneeze, I turned around and in my face were 40 more chimpanzees. They wag wiggled, they jag jiggled. One said, if you please, you may call me by my proper name, Deborah Louise. She said, I am just a go-go ape. I go-go everywhere in my red leather boots with my punky monkey hair. So, I called the police, I dialed 911. I said, I think you'd better hurry up. This house has come undone. The next thing I knew, those apes were playing rock and roll. They were twisting on the table and broke my cereal bowl. They were dancing to the Beatles, that's an old singing group, and they crumbled up crackers in my minestrone soup. And then they turned up the volume on my brother's ghetto blaster. They got clumsy, they got goofy, they danced faster, faster, faster. So I shouted in the phone, it's a national irrational primordial disaster. But, Before I had the time to give the number of our street, I was interrupted rudely by a crash-bang beat. There were 55 monkeys singing do si do saying yee-haw, get down, swing your partner by the toe. Promenade, lemonade, do si do They swirled and twirled in crinoline skirts. They wore 10-gallon hats. They had rhinestones in their shirts. So I called the police. I said, what can you do? Has anyone reported monkeys missing from the zoo? Then, coming from the basement was a slow, soft song. I peeked and I saw orangutans tangoing along. They were dipping, they were slipping, they were flipping right out. So I got irritated and I heard myself shout, You apes have got to get, all monkeys have to go. 
and they all stopped dancing and they shouted at me, no. So, I called the police and a security guard. I said, come get these apes, get them out of my yard. For I already seen all those monkeys on the lawn. They were playing croquet and they had gold shoes on. Some were dancing on the clothesline, some were swinging from the trees. Hilarious, gregarious, chimpanzees. And then, Coming from upstairs was a wheezy whining sound. So I ran right up, I took a peek, I took a look around. There were monkeys in my bedroom. They were messing up my quilts. One was playing bagpipes and they were wearing tartan kilts. One said, you can call me Macintosh. He did the Highland Fling. One said, Kuchirabura, but I didn't say a thing. I just called the police and the FBI and the Scotland Yard and the private eye. I said, this place is chaos. I said, baboon catastrophe. You folks have got to get help. You've got to rescue me. Because... Those apes had taken bubble bath and dumped it in the tub. They played Hawaiian music. They did the hula as they scrubbed. Well, I watched for a minute, then I went and jumped right in. Don't know why, just thought I'd try, but as soon as I got dry, I called the police, I called the SMP, I was extra polite, I said, pretty, pretty, please, as I shouted out, help, Ch -ch 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 chimpanzees. Some gorillas crunched granola, some were eating toast and peas, some were slurping macaroni topped with gorgonzola cheese. So I got down on my knees. I said, this place is chaos. I cried a complete catastrophe. I sobbed, I want my mama. I sniffed, woe be gone is me. So, I'm doing all kinds of stuff. I went to the kitchen sink, which is a place where I think and think and think. Then suddenly I had an idea, the solution to save the day. I shouted out one word, bananas, and all those monkeys stopped. I said, now that I have your attention, I'd like all you monkeys, chimpanzees, apes, and gorillas to go. Get, skedaddle, hurry up, get out of this place. Well, one monkey came right over, one wiped my tears away. She says, I guess that we should go. That's all you had to say. Then one said, my name is Aristotle. One said, call me Socrates. I said, I'm really pleased to meet you. Glad to know you, chimpanzees. But just then I heard a siren and I knew my help had come. There were 49 Mounties and they were blowing bubble gum. I said, this is no time for chewing. This is no time for bubbles. I'll tell you that this neighborhood has got its share of troubles. I'm Inspector Leanne Jane, said a woman dressed in red. Can you tell us what your name is? Well, uh, Willow Willoughby, I said. Well, well, a Willow Willoughby, you have called us several times. You said you had some monkey business. Now we're here to solve these crimes. Then she blew the biggest bubble, so I burst it in her face. Look, I said, chimpanzees all over this place. And she said, where? Now you probably won't believe me, but those monkeys were all gone. No monkeys in the kitchen, no monkeys on the lawn, no monkeys on the clothesline, they had left the neighborhood. There I thought it's over, I guess those apes have gone for good. The inspector was not smiling. She said, is this a false alarm? Should I send you to the zoo or perhaps a monkey farm? I said, but there were monkeys in the kitchen. They were climbing up the walls. They were dancing on the ceiling. They were bouncing basketballs. Indeed, said the inspector. We do not have the time. We Mounties are too busy. We're off to solve another crime. So everything was over. No dancing apes around. I found the house a little quiet and I sort of missed the monkey sound, but 
I think I saw an elephant just open up my door. And I've got a funny feeling there are several hundred more. And that's there were monkeys in my kitchen. And I think we can see that there's so many different ways that you can write a poem or tell a poem or use um, poetry to tell a story. And sometimes poems rhyme, but they don't have to. And I think, just my opinion, I think it's so much more fun when a poem has an illustration too. So maybe you'll try writing a poem. And if you do, I would love to hear from you. Um, and I think that next week, because um, we'll be doing stories on December 21st, which is the shortest day of the year, we're going to talk about uh, the winter solstice and what it means to have a very short day. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a great week and I will see you soon. Bye.